All right, welcome back to our read aloud. We have a new book to start. Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Okay, weird title. I'll show you guys the cover at home. All right, now I'm going to pause and show everyone else our cover here at school. All right, I am back. So, I was just telling the kids in class this book won the Newbery Medal of the Year, so that means it was best book of the year in 1971. And it is worth quite a few AR points, so make sure you're listening. And here we go. Mrs. Frisbee, the head of a family of field mice, lived in an underground house in the vegetable garden of a farmer named Mr. Fitzgibbon. It was a winter house, such as some field mice move to when food becomes too scarce, and the living too hard in the woods and pastures. In the soft earth of a bean, potato, black-eyed pea, and asparagus patch, there is plenty of food left over for mice after the human crop has been gathered. Mrs. Frisbee and her family were especially lucky in the house itself. It was a slightly damaged cinder block, the hollow kind with two oval holes in it. It had somehow been abandoned in the garden during the summer and lay almost completely buried with only a bit of one corner showing above ground, which is how Mrs. Frisbee had discovered it. So these cinder blocks, they are like the ones we have on our wall. If we could see inside them, there's those two holes. Yeah. So one of those blocks is in the ground and they use those two holes as like their bedroom and living room. Okay, so you think mice, they're tiny. And my book fell and I lost my spot. Yeah, but how do you get to one room and another? They're gonna tell all about it. It lay on its side in such a way that the solid parts of the block formed a roof and a floor, both waterproof, and the hollows made two spacious rooms. Lined with bits of leaves, grass, cloth, cotton fluff, feathers, and other soft things Mrs. Frisbee and her children had collected, the house stayed dry, warm, and comfortable all winter. A tunnel to the surface earth of the garden, dug so that it was slightly larger than a mouse and slightly smaller than a cat's foreleg. Why do you want the hole smaller than a cat's leg? Hudson? Because um, cats eat mice. Yeah, they could stick their arm in there and get them. That keeps the cat's paw out? Yeah. Yeah. Um, slightly smaller than a cat's foreleg, providing access, air, and even a fair amount of light to the living room. The bedroom, formed by a second oval, was warm but dark, even at midday. A short tunnel through the earth behind the block connected the two rooms. So that's how they're connected. Mm -hmm. Although she was a widow, what does that mean? If you're a widow, Madeline? Like if your husband died and you have nobody else. Yep. So although she was a widow, her husband had died only the preceding summer. Mrs. Frisbee was able, through luck and hard work, to keep her family, there were four children, happy and well fed. January and February were the hardest months. The sharp, hard cold that begun in December lasted until March. And by February, the beans and black eyes had been picked over with help from the birds. The asparagus roots were frozen into stone, and the potatoes had been thawed and refrozen so many times that they had acquired a slimy texture and a rancid taste. Still, the Frisbees made the best of what there was, and one way or another they kept from being hungry. Then one day, at the very end of February, Mrs. Frisbee's younger son, Timothy, fell ill. That day began with a dry, bright, icy morning. Mrs. Frisbee woke up early, as she always did. She and her family slept close together in a bed of down, fluff, and bits of cloth they had gathered, warm as a ball of fur. She stood up, so, she stood up carefully so as to not wake the children and walked quietly through the short tunnel to the living room. Here it was not so warm, but not really cold either. She could see from the light filtering down the entrance tunnel that the sun was up and bright. She looked at the food in her pantry, a hollowed out space lined with small stones in the earth behind the living room. There was plenty of food for breakfast and lunch and dinner too, for that matter. But still, the sight depressed her, for it was the same tiresome fare they had been eating every day, every meal for the last month. She wished she knew where to find a bit of green lettuce or a small egg or a taste of cheese or a corn muffin. There were eggs in plenty not far off in the hen house, but hens and hen's eggs are too big for field mice to cope with. And besides, between the garden and the hen house, there was a wide sward of shrubs and grass, some of it grown up quite tall. Cat territory. Boys. She climbed up the tunnel, emerging whiskers first, and looked around warily. The air was sharp, and there was white frost, 
thick on the ground and on the dead leaves at the edge of the wood across the garden patch. Mrs. Frisbee set off over the gently furrowed earth, and when she reached the fence, she turned right, skirting the border of the forest, searching with her bright round eyes for a bit of carrot, a frozen parsnip, or something green. But there was nothing green at this time of the year but the needles on the pine trees and the leaves on the holly, neither of which a mouse, or any animal for that matter, can eat. And then, straight in front of her, she did see something green. She had reached the far corner of the garden, and there at the edge of the woods, where it met the fence, was a stump. In the stump there was a hole, and out of the hole protruded something that looked a little like a leaf, but was not. Mrs. Frisbee had no trouble at all going through the cattle wire fence, but she approached the hole cautiously. If the stump was hollow as it seemed to be, there was no telling who or what might be living in it. Madeline? Is, is she a mouse? Mm-hmm. Yep. A foot or so from the hole she stopped, stood still and watched and listened. She could hear no sound, but from there she could see what the green was. It was, in fact, a yellowish brownish green. A bit of a corn chuck. But what was a corn chuck doing there? The cornfield was in a different part of the farm altogether, away beyond the pasture. Mrs. Frisbee hopped closer and then carefully crept up the side of the stump and peered inside. When her eyes got used to the dark, she saw that she had found a treasure, a winter's supply of food carefully stored and then, for some reason, forgotten or abandoned. But stored by whom? A raccoon, perhaps? Not very likely, so far from the stream. More likely a squirrel or a groundhog. She knew that both of these felt free to help themselves to the new corn each year, and that they were strong enough to carry ears away and store them. But whoever had done it, why had he then abandoned his store? And then she remembered. Back in November, there had come from the near edge of that woods the sound that sends all the animals in the forest shivering to their hiding places. The sound of hunters' guns shooting, the sound that is accompanied for someone by a fiery, stabbing pain. And then he never needs his stored food again. What is she describing right there? Eric? Elf. Yeah, so if an animal gets killed, they hear that sound, and she's saying some animal feels the bullet, right? And then they don't need their stored food. Emma? It's evil. I'm sure that I'm sure True. We, le we learned about poachers in the last book. It's po it's kind of poaching, and some animals have to be hunted down for food and stuff. Right. So I understand this. I grew up in a family where we did hunt. Instead of buying all our food at the grocery store, we would hunt for some of our food. So that is just kind of part of life, right? But when you think about it from these animals' perspective, it's a little different. Okay. I think I lost my spot. Okay. Still, since Mrs. Frisbee did not even know what kind of animal it had been, much less his name, she could not shed many tears over him, and food was food. It was not the green lettuce she had longed for, but she and her children were extremely fond of corn, and there were eight large ears in the stump, a noble supply for a mouse family. Down under the corn, she could also see a pile of fresh peanuts, still from another part of the farm, some hickory nuts and a stack of dried, sweet-smelling mushrooms. With her forepaws and sharp teeth, she pulled off a part of the husk from the top ear of corn and folded it down to serve as a crude carrying bag. Then she pulled loose as many of the yellow kernels as she could easily lift, and putting, it, putting them in the shuck bag, she hopped off briskly for home. She would come back for more after breakfast and bring the children to help. She backed down the tunnel entrance to her house, tail first, pulling the corn after her and calling cheerfully as she went. Children, wake up! See what I have for breakfast! A surprise! They came hurrying out, rubbing their eyes in excitement, for any kind of surprise in food was a rare and festive thing in the cold dead of winter. Teresa, the oldest, came first. Crowding close behind her was Martin, the biggest, a strong, quick mouse, dark-haired and handsome like his poor father. Then came Cynthia, the youngest, a slim, pretty girl mouse, light-haired and in fact a little light-headed as well and over-fond of dancing. What does it mean if you're light-headed? Josiah? Sort of dumb. Yeah, she might be kind of ditzy and say things that you go, really. Where is it, she said. What is it? What's the surprise? Where is Timothy? asked Mrs. Frisbee. Mother, said Teresa, concerned. He says he's sick and can't get up. 
Nonsense, Martin. Tell your brother to get out of bed at once or he'll get no breakfast. Martin ran to the bedroom obediently but came back in a moment alone. He says he feels too sick and he doesn't want any breakfast, even a surprise. I felt his forehead and it's burning hot. Oh dear, said Mrs. Frisby. That sounds as if he really is sick. Timothy had on occasion been known to think he was sick when he really was not. Here, you may all have your breakfast. Save Timothy's and I'll go see what's wrong. She opened up the green carrying bag and put the corn on the table, dividing it into five equal shares. The dining table was a smooth piece of lathe supported on both ends by stones. Corn, shouted Martin. Oh, mother, where did you get it? Eat up, said Mrs. Frisbee, and a little later I'll show you because there's a whole lot more where this came from. And she disappeared into the little hallway that led to the bedroom. A lot more, Martin repeated as he sat down with his two sisters. That sounds like enough to last till moving day. I hope so, Cynthia said. When is moving day, anyway? Two weeks, said Martin authoritatively. Maybe three. Oh, Martin, how do you know, protested Teresa. What if it stays cold? Anyway, suppose Timothy isn't well enough. At this dreadful thought, so casually raised, they all grew worried and fell silent. Then Cynthia said, Teresa, you shouldn't be so gloomy. Of course he'll be well. He's just got a cold, that's all. She finished eating her corn and so did the others. In the bedroom, Mrs. Timothy felt Timothy's, Mrs. Frisbee felt Timothy's forehead. It was indeed hot and damp with sweat. She took his pulse and dropped his wrist in alarm at what she felt. Do you feel sick to your stomach? No, mother, I feel all right, only cold. And when I sit up, I get dizzy and I can't get my breath too well. Mrs. Frisbee peered anxiously at his face and would have looked at his tongue. But in the dark room, she could see no more than the, dime, the dim outline of his head. He was the tiniest of her children, and he had a dark complexion like his brother and father. He was narrow in his face, his eyes were unusually large and bright, and shone with the intensity of his thought when he spoke. He was, Mrs. Frisbee knew, the smartest and most thoughtful of her children, though she would never have admitted this out loud. But he was also the frailest. What does frail mean? Noah? Noah? Yeah, he's fragile. He can easily get sick or get hurt. Um, and when colds or flu or virus infections came around, he was the first to catch them and the slowest to recover. He was also, perhaps as a result, something of a hypochondriac. So a hypochondriac is someone that thinks they're sick all the time, even when they're not. But there was no doubt he was really sick this time. His head felt as if he had a high fever, and his pulse was very fast. Poor Timothy, lie back down and keep covered. She spread over him with the bits of cloth they used as blankets. After a while, we'll fix you a pallet in the living room so you can lay out where it's light. I found a fine supply of corn this morning, more than we can eat for the rest of the winter. Would you like some? No, thank you. I'm not hungry. Not now. He closed his eyes, and in a few minutes, he went to sleep. But it was a restless sleep in which she tossed and moaned continuously. In mid-morning, Mrs. Frisbee, Martin, and Cynthia set off for the stump to carry home some more corn, and some peanuts, and mushrooms. The hickory nuts they would leave, for they were too hard for mouse jaws to crack, and too tedious to gnaw through. They left Teresa home to look after Timothy, whom they had wrapped up and helped into a temporary sick bed in the living room. When they returned at lunchtime carrying heavy loads of food, they found her near tears from worry. Timothy was much worse. His eyes looked wild and strange from the fever. He trembled continuously, and each breath he took sounded like a gasp for life. Teresa said, Oh, Mother, I'm so glad you're back. He's been having nightmares and shouting about monsters and cats, and when I talk to him, he doesn't hear me at all. Not only was Timothy not hearing with his ears, his eyes, though wide open, were not seeing, or if they were, he was not recognizing what they saw. When his mother tried to talk to him, to hold his hand and ask him how he felt, he stared past her as if she did not exist. Then he gave out a low, long moan and seemed to be trying to say something, but the words would not form properly and made no sense at all. The other children stared in frightened silence. Finally, Martin asked, Mother, what is it? What's wrong with him? He is terribly ill. His fever is so high he has become delirious. If you're delirious, that means you might see things or hear things that aren't even real. Sometimes if you get that bad of a fever, that can happen. There is nothing for it. 
I will have to go and see Mr. Aegis. Timothy must have medicine. And that is the end of our chapter today. Our next chapter is called Mr. Ages, and we will meet him and what's up with him. All right. So I will see you all tomorrow.